Hey friends, Irene Lyon here. Welcome to this video, to this YouTube channel, and to this world of healing trauma, nervous system health, and all things neuroplasticity. First of all, thank you so much for being here and watching this video, Pressing Play. Whether you are brand new or you've been here for a while, I appreciate it. If you haven't yet subscribed to this channel, um, make sure that you do. Somewhere near this video is a little bell that clicks to subscribe. That just means you'll be notified when these videos come out new each week. So today I wanted to talk about dissociation. Someone asked me a little while ago, how do I heal from dissociation? And there are a few layers to this. And sometimes people will call this depersonalization or derealization. I'm going to read a few things. I've got some resources here, and then I'm going to dive into it from a somatic point of view. Now, First of all, very important to know, I am not a psychiatrist, I am not a medical doctor, I am not a psychological therapist. In other words, my line of study is with the body, the somatic self, through um, the works of Dr. Peter Levine's work, Somatic Experiencing, um, my training within something called the Feldenkrais Method, and also the work of Kathy Kane, which is called Somatic Practice. Now, all of these methodologies put together are very very, um, they're so important when it comes to healing from things like dissociation, depersonalization. And um, I'm going to read something from Bessel, Bessel van der Kolk's book, um, The Body Keeps the Score, in a moment. Um, and his title really to this book says it all. Even though he is someone that deals with mental disorders, psychology, psychiatry, he now knows, as many of us know, that to work at these really deep cognitive, um, mind-based mental disorders, we need to get into the body. And the reason why is because when we have had past traumatic experiences and they then create a symptom like dissociation or depersonalization, et cetera. Um, it's happening because the physiology is freaking out in some ways. The internal somatic self is saying, this isn't good, this isn't safe, I better shut down, I better disconnect. And so if we think about someone, again, just gonna use a very hypothetical example, who grew up with a lot of bad, scary things happening to them, and we know this through things like the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study. I've done um, content on that. I'll link some of that below. But basically, when we have, imagine a little person, a child, a teenager, an adult, is constantly in a soup of stress. Scary things are happening around them, happening around them and to them all the time. One way that a person copes with that adapts to that, becomes malleable to that, is to shut down. Now, there's some differences in opinion as to whether that shutdown is purely physiological, is it just cognitive? From what I've seen, it's always a blend of both. And um, one person who uh, I have studied with before, many times, Kathy Kane, has written a book, co-written a book with Steve Terrell, um, another one of my teachers. And I did a book list video a little while ago. I'll be sure to click, put that down so that you can click over and watch that in a little bit. But on page 64 of Kathy and Steve's book, she makes a note, or they make a note, I say, where um, they write, although this process may sound the same as dissociation, so they're talking about going into the shutdown response. So when we have lots of bad, scary things happen to us, we, we go into this cascade of survival strategies depending on our situation. It might be fight, it might be flee, getting out of there, or if we can't do either of those, and if we can't befriend the situation and calm down, we will go into a freeze state. Talked about functional freeze in my last videos, a few videos ago. So they write, although this process may sound like the same as dissociation, porges, so here's another person I'm gonna bring in here, Stephen Porges, he kind of um, coined the term polyvagal theory to really that really breaks down the branches of the parasympathetic nervous system. So Porges notes the difference this way. So for Porges, Stephen Porges, he says, the freeze response is a physiological state, whereas dissociation is a psychological construct. So again, we're separating these two things. 
in my experience and in talking to folks, usually there's a little bit of both going on at the same time, but every situation is different. So as I describe some of these things today, know that this is one example, this is one hypothetical, depending on you and your history or the people you know or the clients you have, it might be a mix of a few different things. But long story short, bad, scary things happen to us which are traumatic. If we do not heal and work through those at a deep somatic and mind-based level, both at the same time, one of the symptoms, one of the after effects is this quality of dissociating from ourselves, from our body, from our thoughts and our ability to have cognitive thinking, and then a third from the environment. And one is not worse or better than the other. It depends on the situation. It depends on the person. It depends on so many things, but those three things happen in a variety of ways and sometimes all at the same time. So to go back to the original uh, question, which was, how does one heal these dissociative states? Um, I'm going to read a little bit more and then we're going to get into this. And the first thing to understand is that this is something that occurs as a result of traumatic experiences, scary things that occur to us. And the reason why we, we split away from our body, from our brain and from the environment is the intensity, what is coming into our system, what we're feeling physiologically is too much for our physiology. If we go with Porges' definition, our physiology can't handle what it's feeling. We don't have the capacity to be with all the intense somatic experiences. And further to that, in terms of the psychology, the cognitive construct, as he called it, we don't have the capacity to make sense of what is happening. A classic thing you will hear from someone who is, who is being, say, brutalized, victimized, who's being traumatized. Um, you hear this a lot when people are being physically attacked, sexually attacked is they will say that they will go numb. Not only can they not feel their bodies, but they're outside of their bodies or they're above their bodies watching this happen and they don't know what's going on. There is literally a numbing at all organismic levels and disconnection from the environment. And so that occurs. And then of course, because of how the human system is, how our society is set up, Usually, I'm gonna, again, this is a huge generalization here. We don't come out of these attacks, these stressful events, these deep, deep traumatic experiences saying to ourselves, I better find that somatic practitioner to help me process this attack or this assault or this dissociation or this body freeze I'm feeling. It just hasn't been in our way of dealing with this. We might report it. We might not say anything. We might forget that it even occurs. Many people have said to me, um, I didn't even remember that this occurred. And I just, you know, it's like this amnesia, this dissociative amnesia, not only physically, but mentally of what occurred. It's a way of protecting our system from this bad, scary thing that occurred to us. So, we tend to not go and look for these very deep somatic healing experiences to get that survival stress and that trauma out of the system. And then as time goes on, this is where we get, this is how we continue to live in a state of dissociation, live in a state of, as we would call a freeze response, even a functional freeze response. Again, I talked about this in another video. I already mentioned that. Be sure to check that one out. So we've got all these systems on alert, but also they're so alerted that they're shutting us down. And then we get this feeling like we don't exist, that we can't connect to the world, that we don't feel real. And it's really hard to live like that. I'm gonna read one more piece from uh, The Body Keeps the Score. So bear with me here, because I don't wanna give you the whole context, but this is from the chapter, Running for Your Life. The anatomy of survival. So he has described a situation where this couple gets into an accident and one person, he calls the person, I think Stan, um, goes into more of a responsive, activated response, more fight flight kind of quality. Whereas his partner, I think it's his partner, Ayute, 
is the name, um, I think it's a her, um, goes into what he then calls depersonalization, this numbing out, this dissociation. And he writes, depersonalization is one symptom of the massive dissociation caused by traumas. Stan's flashbacks, so his flashbacks of this traumatic event came from his thwarted efforts to escape the crash. So that it was a crash, cued by the script. All his dissociated, fragmented sensations and emotions roared back into the present moment. So there was like this triggering flashback of all the scary stuff that happened, emotions, you know, so that's one way that some people experience old events that haven't been healed at the deep cellular somatic nervous system and cognitive level. Okay. Whereas, um, Yute, his partner, had dissociated her fear and felt nothing. He then goes on to say, and I think this is important, um, I see depersonalization, this dissociation regularly in my office when patients tell me horrendous stories without any feeling. All the energy drains out of the room and I have to make a valiant effort to keep paying attention. A lifeless patient forces you to work much harder to keep the therapy alive. And I often used to pray for the hour to be over quickly. So this is just his personal experience. And uh, I want to read a little bit more, but I want to speak to this. So again, when someone has had these bad, scary things that occur to them and their default is to completely go into this sort of functional freeze, this dissociative mental state, they're disconnecting from their body, they're disconnecting from the environment. It's as if the person is a zombie and there's no one there. They are living, you know, they're showing up for the session, they're feeding themselves, they're clothing themselves, they're maybe going to work, but it's like the, like the soul isn't there anymore, it's been turned off. And when you are living in this state, it can be very, very common when that person works with a the therapist, the therapist will feel that that very kind of deadened energy. And there can often be, and I'm speaking about this, so if you are, say, a therapist or a practitioner, you may start to feel a little dissociated and dreamy yourself. You might start to feel yourself disconnect from your own body. And this is where as the practitioner, whether you're doing massage work, therapy work, Reiki work, it doesn't matter. Is If you are working with someone who is experiencing this kind of deep dissociation, you've got to watch yourself to stay connected to the ground, connected to yourself so that you can help that person move out of that really deep, deep shock state. Okay, next thing I want to read um, is he mentions why this was her preference to go into this depersonalization and it's because of her um, survival strategy as a very young girl. Um, basically, as a child, her nervous system and brain learned to cope with her mother's harsh treatment. So she had a family member, it looks like a mom, who yelled at her, um, you know, was just really mean and angry and her way of dealing with this was to just blank out, to just shut down, to basically go away and not feel the harsh um, expression from her mother. And we know that this is really common. When someone has had a really scary childhood and then they get into, say, an accident later in life, when that childhood is no longer there and they're not living with that abusive parent, that old residue that way that the body had to get wired up to survive is still there. Again, if that person hasn't done the somatic work to heal that old scary stuff, another accident, another event, a big stressor can occur as an adult and it'll kind of recapitulate. It'll bring up those um, responses. And in this case, for her, it was this disconnection, this dissociation, this depersonalization. One more thing I'll read here and I'll move on. He then says the challenge um, with this level of dissociation is we have to get the person engaged and alert. And this is where he writes a bottom up approach to these, to therapy, to the work becomes essential. The aim is actually to change the patient's physiology 
and his or her relationship to bodily sensations. So then he goes into the importance of doing things that involve movement. Um, he's really big on yoga. He's big on sitting on those those big bouncy balls, um, doing pressure, um, things that get the body a little more activated and alert to just sit in a chair and talk about what's being felt is kind of a lost cause because the system knows that too well. It knows how to be there and be still. So we have to find ways to what we would call, at least in the fields of neuroplasticity, we need to neurostimulate, neuroactivate the system gently, of course. We don't wanna go into big cathartic movement. We need to do it gently and titrated so that the person can slowly start to energize their physiology again and reconnect to the environment and their bodies and themselves in a way that is safe. So that was again, reading from a bit of Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score, really good book. It's an intense book. It get, goes into lots of stories. It's a little more clinical in nature, really not a lot of practical exercises, but it describes how trauma gets stuck in the system and how our symptomology comes out in the forms of various psychiatric, mental, and physiological illnesses. So to go back to this question, how to heal dissociation, I wanted to lay these pieces down so that you understand how it can occur, why it occurs when someone especially has had a history of early trauma where they had to shut down. And then the next step is to kind of say, okay, well, we have this situation where we know that we are disconnecting from the world, from ourselves. So we want to reverse engineer that in a way and start to reconnect back to ourselves and the environment. And these are some of the things that I commonly teach my students. Some very simple things like being able to reconnect with the environment. We would call this orienting. Can a person start to see and name things that are outside? I will link another video that gets deep into what the orienting response is, both defensive and exploratory. I'm not gonna get into it in this video. You can go check that out, but quick, little piece with that is again, when we have had bad, scary things occur to us, we will lose our capacity to see the world, see others, and be able to actually relate to the here and now, the present moment. So it could be as something as simple as going outside, even sitting on a porch or going for a walk, something that has a little bit of movement and actively saying, I see the trees, I hear the wind, I hear the birds, maybe stopping and listening to the birds chirp. But while we do that, while we're connecting with the environment, we also want to be connecting to ourselves, whether that is feeling our feet on the floor, maybe moving them a little bit more. Maybe if we're out in a park, taking our shoes off and getting our feet into um, the, the grass, or if we can be by some water, getting into the ocean or a lake, or maybe if it's in your own home, being in, um, let's say a body of water, like a bathtub or warm shower or something that just gives your system a little bit of um, sensory stimulation so that you're feeling more than just the dullness and in many ways the deadness of um, the physiology and the cognition. So you're actively doing things to help spark up feeling, sensation, activating your impulses to see the environment around you, combining these together. Now, another thing that I've talked about in the past quite a bit is the ability to follow our impulses. And this one is really simple and yet it can be very potent. And that is to listen to things like when we have to go to the bathroom. If you've been around here for a while, you know I say this over and over, but trust me when I say it's one of the best ways to start to connect to the physiological body again, which is what we want to do. So clearly, someone who's living in a state of dissociation and depersonalization, they are, we hope, eating, drinking, going to the bathroom, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But sometimes this might happen in an unconscious way. So can the person, can you, um, start to feel things like the bladder being full? Actually saying out loud to yourself, whoa, I'm feeling my bladder is full, I need to go to the washroom, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna do it. 
and to actually be connected to the experience of of peeing, of urinating. Same with bowel movements. When the rectum is full and you feel that pressure, I know this is descript, but we all do it, to actually engage with that in just a neutral way, the way animals would. They, they don't question when they go, they just go. Trust me, if you've never seen a cow or a pasture of cows, you know that they just go. There's no asking, it just comes through. So one of the ways, again, that we can connect with our body and reconnect this con this connection essentially is to feel some of these internal impulses and to name them when they happen. Give it a try, it's one way of reconnecting to the system. Other ways to listen to our impulses when we need to, um, let's say cough or sneeze or when we're thirsty, when we're yawning. Again, these are these things that just occur and they often occur and we just don't even notice that they're happening. If we can start to catch some of these little things that are occurring, pause, feel our body, feel how we're connected to the ground, listen, let it happen, and really acknowledge the biology that is our system. This is another step in the right direction of reconnecting to our sense of self. Because again, bad, scary things happen to us, we're gonna disconnect from this stuff. So we wanna reconnect to that. So I already mentioned orienting, this ability to connect with the environment, the bodily impulses. Movement is another thing, and I speak to this a lot. But again, as uh, Bessel said in this book, we need to work with the body. We need to get it moving, whether it's through making sound, singing, sitting on a, a physio, one of those balls that kind of throws our balance off. It might be standing on some of those, um, those discs that someone might use at a physical therapy session to improve balance. Um, it could be going for a walk and getting the heart rate up a little bit, but not in a way that is disconnecting from the body. Again, it's to, be a bit more vigorous with the movement, but to really feel it and to maybe stop every now and again and feel the heart beating, feel the physiology perking up, and then at the same time, also connecting to the environment. Other ways that we can connect with the body, and there are so many practices that have taught us how to touch and put pressure, things like acupressure, even all the tapping uh, practices, are ways to stimulate and activate the touch, but it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be as simple as just feeling this, feeling our arms, feeling our shoulders, feeling our chest, our thighs. I've done um, one other video on this, I'll pop it below. It uh, guides you through a way of holding, I call it the self-hold and do-it-yourself medicine. It's an ancient way um, of reconnecting and re kind of invigorating the energy in the body. Very simple. Again, something I've learned through Peter Levine, and he took that from a practice of, of Eastern tradition. So check that out as well. Um, so again, there isn't this one step process or two step process or 12 step process or 20 step process to heal from dissociation. Everyone's going to be different but I do think it comes down to a few things. Number one, education. So you're getting the starting points of that here, learning about why the system shut down, why the cognition went offline, why your system wanted you to forget that you were here on this planet, living and breathing as a human being. When again, scary things occur to us, the system protects, it protects the internal, it doesn't want to feel scary things and it doesn't want to remember the scary things. However, to heal, we have to start to bring these stories back. We have to bring back the understanding of why this occurred, why our system went into that shutdown response. And then how can we start to reboot and rewire the system so that we can drop by drop, piece by piece, bring in more of our connection with the environment, with ourselves, and most importantly, connecting them both together. And this is one of the, we could say, one of the cruxes of really, really good somatic nervous system healing work. It's not about just doing the orienting, and it's not just about doing the touch, and it's not just about making sound, and it's not just about 
being with the sensations. It's about those things, but it's about bringing them all together so that we restore wholeness and unity to the system. At the end of the day, that's what we want. Um, again, depending on the person, one entry point might be better. Maybe it is being movement-based, or another person might really enjoy sitting in the park and just listening to the birds. Other people might love being in a bath and just feeling the heat and the warmth and the steam and the, the essential oils coming in. And then slowly we start to bring in the other pieces and then the other pieces. And over time, with consistency and care and connection and safety and understanding how all the old sensations that we shut down and the old emotions, they might start to come back out. The anger, the sadness, the fear, the disgust, as we build this capacity to be with the environment and ourselves at the same time, oriented, oriented to it, staying connected, this allows for these emotions and these old, bad, scary, traumatic experiences to come up and out, be felt, be faced, be integrated, and that is how we heal. Thank you so much for being here. I mentioned a lot of other videos and resources, ones on orienting, um, there's one on titration that I want you to check out, one on pendulation that I want you to check out. I will put them all below. I'll also put these uh, books that I referenced into the show more section. Thank you so much for being here and we will see you next time. Bye.